Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Monty Hart Lecture Series. We have a great lecture today from Dr. Rusha Parikh uh, that will be speaking about the use of cardiac CT for left atrial appendage evaluation. It's a great honor to have you here, uh, Dr. Parikh. I, I saw your lecture at SCCT and, and I was very impressed by it. So I think uh, this is a, it's an upcoming and a new technology that, that I believe should be used for CT. So I'm, I'm very excited about your lecture. So Dr. Rusha Barik is an assistant professor of medicine. She's a cardiologist specializing in advanced multimodality cardiovascular imaging, associate director of cardiac CT, and associate program director of the cardiovascular imaging fellowship at St. Francis Hospital and Heart Center. She completed her residency in internal medicine at, at Cleveland Clinic Foundation, followed by a fellowship in cardiovascular disease at Icahn School of Medicine at Mount Sinai Beth Israel. And then she further underwent a two-year advanced cardiovascular imaging fellowship at the renowned uh, Houston Methodist Hospital. She's so an in integral part of the developing of the cardiac CT workflow and operations of the first cardiac-only neutom alpha photon counting detector CT uh, in the US, which is at San Francisco Hospital. Uh, she, Dr. Parikh, has been faculty and invited speaker at national, national and international meetings, including the ACC, the American Society of Echocardiography Meeting, SCCT, and SCMR. Thank you very much for taking the time to teach us some, some new things about the use of CT on the appendage evaluation. Thank you, Leandra, for the kind introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to go through a whirlwind tour of cardiac CT for left atrial appendage evaluation. These are my disclosures. So when we talk about left atrial appendage occlusion CT imaging, the first thing I want to talk about is contrast and the protocol. You want to use injection volumes, rates of contrast, and saline, which usually match what is done for coronary CTA. You don't wanna to attempt to use low contrast protocols. Typically, you want more than 450 Hounsfield unit enhancement in the left atrium, which would be ideal. So first, let's talk about acquisition settings. So pre-implant CT, you wanna make sure it's ECG gated. You want dose modulation. If it is applied, the pulse should be maximum at the 250 to 400 milliseconds, which is about 30 to 60% of the RR interval. So this targets end systole for most heart rates and rhythms when the left atrial appendage is largest. So you wanna make sure you get the correct images and phase of the left atrial appendage. So images should be obtained in a phase corresponding to prefer preferably a narrow predefined RR interval within this range. And this helps to reduce the radiation exposure. When we talk about post left atrial appendage occlusion implant study, we want this also to be ECG gated. We want it either retrospective or sequential scanning with prospective gating with a larger interval. So you want systole as well as diastole. You do not wanna use dose modulation or variable ECG pulsing at this a type of imaging since there's noise, motion, metallic artifact, and the reduced tube current may impede the visualization of peri device leaks and thrombi. For both of these types of scans, we want to include a delayed scan at 30 or 60 seconds after completion of the corner, uh, the initial CTA, and targeting about 350 to 400 milliseconds after the R wave, and with Z axis coverage to include the left atrial appendage. So this can be a limited scan. So let's go over the objectives of pre-procedural imaging for left atrial appendage closure evaluation. We want to exclude left atrial appendage thrombus. We want to assess the left atrial appendage relationship to the surrounding structures. We want to plan the transeptal puncture. We want to assess the dimensions of the appendage for device selection and sizing. We, want, we may want to assess it for 3D printing and complex anatomies, and there is a potential for fusion imaging. So first, let's talk about assessment of thrombus. Typically, the standard of care had or had been transesophageal echocardiogram. But here, this meta-analysis showed that with the combination of a delayed scan, 
CT had good sensitivity, specificity, and predictive values for prediction of thrombus. Here we can see a CT on the left panel and TE Im images on the right panel. We can see both data sets have well delineated landmarks. We can see prominent left atrial appendage trabeculation and there's no thrombus. So let's talk about left atrial appendage anatomy. It's a finger-like extension of the anterolateral left atrium. It's located in the left AV groove between the pulmonary trunk superiorly and the left ventricle inferiorly. One or lo more lobes can be demarcated by an external crease. It's typically thin-walled structure about one millimeter thin with a rough internal surface because of thick pectinate muscles and or trabeculations. And the left atrial appendage also has contractility and quadriphasic blood flow in a normal rhythm, which is impaired in patients with atrial fibrillation. So when we evaluate the left atrial appendage, we want to initially exclude thrombus on the basis of the axial views of the appendage. We wanna check the Hounsfield units to make sure that the contrast is adequate. And if there's low attenuation, which we can see here on the tip of the appendage, the differential would be slow flow or thrombus. Next, we evaluate the delayed images here, contrast filling defects may represent slow flow due to the low velocities, and thus a comparison is required between the early and delayed images, which will determine whether there is a filling defect and if it represents slow flow or thrombus. Here, when we look at the Hounsfield units, we can see they're all positive and similar to the left atrium, which suggests that there is no slow, which this was just slow flow and no thrombus. You can also see on the outside of the appendage, there is a negative Hounsfield unit, which indicates that there is fat outside the left atrial appendage. You don't wanna mistake this for thromb uh, by calling this thrombus. On the 3D image here, you can see that the appendage is short and stubby. Here, these images show a visible defect in the left and right atrial appendage on both early and delayed imaging consistent with thrombus. Here on the left panel, A and B demonstrates a filling defect visible in the early acquisition, but not in the late acquisition, and this indicates slow flow. Here, the right panel demonstrates contrast filling defects present in both early as well as delayed image acquisition and most likely represents thrombus. So this is a TE showing stasis and slow flow in the appendage. Ultrasound enhancing agent was used and slowly over time, it fills into the tip of the appendage. And subsequently, there is a slow washout from the tip as well. So using this concept, it works for contrast agent in CT as well. So here we gave the patient 10 ml of extra contrast two minutes prior to the full dose. On the left panel, you can see the Hounsfield unit is high in the left atrium. Also in the left atrial appendage, it's 693. However, at the tip, it is low at 136. On delayed imaging, which was done at 45 seconds, the filling defect or the slow flow, which was 136, now has a higher Hounsfield unit of 250, which is higher than rest of the appendage and left atrium, suggesting that the contrast did not wash out as fast as the other segments of the left atrial appendage and atrium. And this is consistent with sludge or slow flow and proves that there is no thrombus. If you're doing a test bolus, it automatically functions as the extra contrast protocol. So this is another protocol using prone imaging to rule out thrombus. This was shared by Dr. Marcus Scherer from Atrium Health who does this routinely. So the top panel is our routine supine imaging where even at five minute delay, there's still an area at the tip of the appendage that cannot be ruled out for thrombus. When the same protocol is repeated in prone position, you can see that the contrast gravitate towards the tip of the appendage and appears the brightest and there's delayed clearing of this contrast and this confirms that there is no thrombus. While reviewing the left atrium, you also want to identify di diverticulum, 
and evaluate for thrombus as well. So here we have a few extra diverticulums in addition to the left atrial appendage. So next, we'll move on to the devices. There's currently a lot of devices available. Here we have the Watchman, Amulet, Lariat, and Atriclip that are FDA approved. We have a few in the trial phase that is Waypress, Lambre, Sierra, and Conformal. So the market is going to be booming with even more devices, which makes this an even more important topic. So what is our imaging approach to percutaneous left atrial appendage exclusion? Morphology matters. So feasibility and device sizing matters. We want to cycle, have good timing in the cardiac cycle. We want the maximal left atrial appendage size, which is near and ventricular syst systole. We want to measure the osteal landing zone widths and left atrial appendage depths. We want an osteal plane and the main lobe versus transeptal puncture and guide selection. We want to look for accessory lobe locations and beware of difficult to cover basal lobes when we review baseline imaging. We want to assess for prominent pectinate or lobe divisions and then differentiate left atrial appended stasis or sludge from thrombus, which we already reviewed. When we do transesophageal assessment of left atrial appendage, we typically image at 0, 45, 90, 135, take the largest dimension and measure the depths. We can do a similar 3D assessment as well, which is more accurate. So let's go over assessment of the CT for Watchman, looking at the ostium, the depth via MPR imaging. So we want to assess the device landing zone and the length and depth of the appendage. So the first step is find the optimal left atrial osteal landing zone plane using the mitral landmark, left circumflex, left atrial appendage ridge, and the left upper pulmonary vein as references. It's typically defined as a line connecting the left circumflex artery and the pulmonary vein and a the line about one to two centimeter inside the left atrial appendage. So you wanna measure that. Then you want to measure the depth, which is perpendicular to the osteal landing zone. You want to inspect for prominent trabeculae or uncovered lobes. You want to prescribe the 3D coaxial implant angle and then inspect the atrial septum for transeptal puncture. You want to reference a watchman sizing chart and use a device at least three millimeter larger than the largest diameter. So I recommend that you have this chart handy when you're reading the CT. The left atrial appendage ostium can range from a size of 14 to 31.5 millimeters. What is also important is looking at the minimum left atrial appendage length that can accommodate the specific devices. So you need your appendage length to be at least 10 millimeters and ranging up to 18 millimeters. And compression does affect the length of the device. Here you can see this is normal, this is medium amount of compression, and when there's more compression, the device does elongate. Next, let's look at assessment of the CT for amulet. So here we have a few more landmarks. We have the orifice, which is defined as the line connecting the left upper pulmonary vein and the circumflex coronary artery. So here you have your main orifice. Then you have a landing zone that is positioned 10 to 12 millimeters inside the left atrial appendage from the orifice and perpendicular to the left atrial appendage wall. And then you have the depth of the appendage, which is measured from the central perpendicular line from the orifice to the roof of the appendage. So we need our flush ostium, which will accommodate the location of the disc covers. And then we have our landing zone, which accommodates this plug and lobe occluder. So we have a few more here. And in terms of measuring the landing zone, you want to measure it 12 millimeters for amulet devices that are going to be more than 25 millimeters. And you want to measure it at 10 millimeters for amulet devices that are going to be less than 25 millimeters. 
And here's the Amulet IFU on device sizing. So here we also want to use the maximum with 2D imaging. And if you're using 3D imaging, you want to use the mean when you're using TE. So what are the advantages of cardiac CT for left atrial appendage uh, evaluation pre occlusion device. So it's non-invasive and no sedations required. The patient does not need to be NPO for liquids. Typically an NPO status with TE can reduce the left atrial appendage size as the left atrial pressures are lower. You can reconstruct the data in any plane even after the patient leaves. You have a higher 3D spatial resolution, which is typically less than 0.5 millimeters for CT in all planes, compared to TEE for more precise measurements to select the optimal device size. You can offer plane of references to predict ideal watchman or amulet implant procedure angles and transeptal puncture locations. You can have an improved understanding of anatomy, procedural planning, efficiency, and overall patient and physician experience. So what are the pitfalls? These are some of the potential pitfalls of cardiac CT. You require tech and physician training of unfamiliar imaging protocols, data reconstruction, and measurement methods. Like anything else, there's a learning curve and a time investment. There is overcall of thrombus and recognition of stasis. This can be overcome by delayed phase imaging, and this is one of the reasons I went over evaluation for thrombus in detail. There's motion and misalignment and STEF artifacts. This can be overcome by newer generation scanners, understanding ideal phase reconstructions, and CT tech diligence on patient prep. Good breathing instructions, if needed, some rate control. There is radiation exposure, though this becomes less relevant in our typical elderly referral cohort. There is contrast exposure, and we know that severe adverse reactions or AKI are rare. However, there is a group of patients where you cannot use this method. Next, let's talk about left atrial appendage morphology on CT. So you have a windsock appearance where there's a one dominant lobe as the primary structure. Then you have a cactus appearance where there's a dominant central lobe with multiple secondary lobes extending in superior and inferior direction. Here you have a cauliflower where the main lobe is not longer than the distal part of the appendage. It could have variable number of lobes with no specific dominant lobe. And then the chicken wing which is, has an obvious bend in the proximal or middle part of the dominant lobe folding upon itself. The anatomy is highly variable, so pre-procedural imaging is paramount to guide the operator in accurate sizing, device selection, and planning of the intervention, which started, starts with identifying the morphology. So here, the upper figure shows a chicken wing morphology which could be of varying type. The upper two have non-acute angles and are were classified as high-risk morphology for thrombus, whereas the lower have acute angles and were described as low-risk morphology of thrombus and stroke. So even different variants of the chicken wing have different risk profile. When we talk about left atrial appendage, we also want to look at the prominent trabeculations, which could be limiting the deployment length. So here we see that there's a big trabeculation, which would limit the length of the device. So the length here it measures as 14.3 millimeters. Based on our measurements, the minimum length we would need is 15.5 millimeters. So this patient at this current state would not be a good candidate. When we look at transeptal anatomy, we want to look and see if the septum's normal, the presence of atrial septal aneurysm, look for lipomatous hypertrophy, presence of a PFO, look for ASD or even septal closure devices. This would help in transeptal planning and assess the difficulty of the procedure.
we want to make sure there's right-sided opacification so we can see the interatrial septum well. Here we have a slide showing the TE and angiographic views by CT, where we can see that our CT can replicate very well what we're seeing on TE. This is a slide shared by Dr. Omar Khalik, which shows complete access planning that can be done by an angiographic representation created from our cardiac CT. We can define planes anatomically, assess superior, inferior, AP, apical, basal, plan our transeptal, uh, and the coaxiality of our catheters to get into the left atrial appendage ostium and how to implant the device. Next, I want to touch base on computational modeling of left atrial appendage closure procedures. So this was a study done that showed that using computational modeling of a pre-procedural CT, we could help in planning of percutaneous closure of the left atrial appendage. The group with computational modeling had improved intraprocedural outcomes with decrease in the total number of closure devices used, a 50% decrease in total number of device repositionings, a 25% reduction in radiation and contrast medium. It also had improved post-procedural outcomes with a 40% improved complete closure with no leaks, less than 60% retraction of amulet discs into the left atrial appendage, and less than 80% risk for device-related thrombus as opposed to standard CT planning. This is a sample of a patient CT who we sent to FEOPS for evaluation. So we send our CT, they give us austere measurements with a minimal, maximal diameter, mean diameter, area-based diameter, a perimeter-based diameter. It then recommends different sizes of the Watchman Flex or the amulet, depending on what you request. So here it stimulate, simulated uh, three types of devices. So you have 24, 27, 31. And here you can see with the computational modeling, a 27 with the distal deployment would be best suited for this patient with best outcomes. So we talked about pre-procedural CT evaluation. Next, I wanna to touch base on intraprocedural CT. So these slides were shared by Dr. Ron Jacob who uh, uses intraprocedural CT at their site at York Hospital routinely. So they have a CT present in their uh, path lab suite where they do these procedures. So their typical protocol is inject contrast during the Watchman procedure through the femoral sheath. They inject about 40 cc of contrast followed by saline and they perform a delay five seconds after contrast injection. And the coverage is typically eight centimeters to cover just the left atrial appendage and a full cardiac cycle CT is obtained. So here are some images of the Watchman in sight with the catheters in place. This is TEE during the procedure, and this is the CT obtained during the procedure. So one of the big utilities is, of course, you know, intraprocedural device position. But this is compared looking at a CT post-procedure about 12 weeks after. And you can see this soft tissue here. So is this hypoattenuated thickening or is this soft tissue overhang just from the normal structures of the heart? And on comparing it with the intraprocedural CT, you can see that there was this overhang here present as well during the procedure. So this suggests this is just soft tissue. So this is how the baseline intraprocedural CT can also be helpful. So next, let's move on to cardiac CT post-implantation. We want to look at device positioning and compression. And the other things and patterns we want to identify is, is there de device endothelialization? Is there device-related thrombus, which is called DRT? Peri-device tissue gaps or leaks? 
and peridivisis versus intradivice left atrial appendage communication. So when we see contrast in the left atrial appendage, understanding did this come through the device or did this come through the side? I wanna thank Dr. Marcus Scherer at Atrium Health again for sharing some of his images. They've been using CT routinely post Watchman for many years. So this is a normal post left atrial appendage occluder implant CT. Here you can see that there's complete seal. There's no contrast in the left atrial appendage. There's good seating. You have measurements here that show that there is good compression as well. And there is no device related thrombus. So this is another patient post Watchman where you can see that there is contrast going through the device. This was done at about one year post uh, Watchman placement. On the here, it looks like it's well seated, but when you look at this image here, you can see that it is not well seated. The fabric pr probably ends over here. And here you can see that there is incomplete seal and the Watchman's open. There's no endothelialization. However, there is no device-related thrombus. Next, let's talk about hypoattenuated thickening on devices. So this was a study that was performed by Kramer and all and was recently published in the European Heart Journal of Cardiovascular Imaging, where they suggested an algorithm for analysis of hypoattenuated thickening on device or hat. So you want to look for hat, is it present in the screw and the hub cove? Next, you want to look at what is the height? Is the height of the hypoattenuated thickening more than the cove or less than the cove? If it is less than the cove, this is all probably subfabric and it's normal part of endothelialization. Next, if it's more than uh, the cove, then you can check, is it on the surface? and understand the pattern. So is it pedunculated? So here you can see this is pedunculated and this would quantify as high grade hypoattenuated thickening. Next, you look at the thickness. If it is less than three millimeters, it is low grade. So it's low grade protruding. It could be sessile or it could just it, be laying right at that level. So this is typically less than three millimeters. If it's protruding and more than three millimeters, if it's low grade and sessile, you can still classify it as low grade. And if, it, uh, if it's more protruding and sessile, you want to call it high grade. So here is an example of a post Watchman device with some hypoattenuated thickening on the device. Again, ranging from three to four millimeters and no mobile component. So this was classified as low grade hypoattenuated thickening, not associated with embolic events in the limited clinical studies that have been done. And it may resolve spontaneously and may just represent a spectrum of platelet aggregation and fibrin deposition. Next, we have an example of a CT that shows a protruding mobile stock with mobile device related thrombus on a 20 millimeter Watchman Flex device. So you can see that here. This is a post Watchman CT which showed a complete and a peri device leak. So we can see that there's contrast in the left atrial appendage from a small peri device leak with incomplete central endothelialization. So we can see on the early images that there is contrast here. And then on the delay phase, we can see a small area of a peri device leak measuring about three and a half centimeter millimeters with an acquisition gap. Next, this is an image showing a combined peri-device leak and incomplete endothelialization. Here you can see that there is a much larger gap at about five millimeters. And you can see that the fabric did not endothelialize. There's a deeper implant 
However, there is no device related thrombus. So you can see contrast going through and on the side. So here we have another CT post left atrial appendage implant, which has both a peri device leak as well as device related thrombus. And you can see that it's protruding asymmetric, irregular hypoattenuated thickening without any left atrial appendage wall continuity. So this was likely from suboptimal positioning and apposition, which caused a peri device leak with the thrombus. So here, this is a case of a post disc and lobe occluder uh, case and amulet, where you can see a small gap which is adjacent to the disc occluder here where you can see at the arrow, but no, there's nothing at the lobe occluder. However, this contrast going through penetrates through the lobe occluder and caused incomplete endothelialization. So we have a leak. So recent data has suggested that peri-device leaks, even small ones, less than five millimeters, are associated with a small increase in thromboembolic events. So initial clinical trials had arbitrarily defined small peri-device leaks as leak widths of less than five millimeters assessed at the time of 45-day post-implant TEs. And this five millimeter cutoff has been carried forwarded in literature and clinical practice. So this data here shows that patients with uh, who underwent left atrial appendage closure and had large leaks had higher risk of thromboembolic events. Patients with small leaks defined as zero to five millimeters still had strokes and TIAs or systemic embolizations and patients with no leaks had the least number of events. So again, a big take home is the two millimeter or five millimeters that were arbitrarily defined need to be re-looked at and as imagers or implanters trying to make sure that there is no leak at all during implantation. So one of the take home messages is systematic checklists in reports for post left atrial appendage occluder assessment. You want to mention the device, the type, the size, the shape of the device and the position. Is it well seated? How is alignment? How is embolization? Is there endothelialization? So is there contrast in the left atrial appendage behind the device? Looking for residual or peri-device leak. Looking for patent uh, left atrial appendage, you wanna look for a mean Hounsfield unit uh, which is, if it's patent, it will be typically 300 plus minus 130. You want to look at your delayed phase as well. Looking for device-associated thrombus or device-related thrombus on the atrial side of the device. And then looking for a pericardial effusion, which would could be a complication from the procedure. When we're looking at cardiac CT, we want high quality images. We want characterization of the implants that are achievable with cardiac CT. We want differentiation of clinically significant device related thrombus from healing or benign hypoattenuated thickening, which can be challenging. So a consensus on definition of DRT is currently lacking and this may account for the wide range in interpretation seen in clinical practice. We want to look at sensitivity to detect left atrial appendage patency through or around the device, which currently appears higher with CT versus TEE. Is this on account of the better and higher spatial resolution or the fact that we can manipulate our data set in a much better way? We want thoughtful reporting of the findings. So benign hypoattenuated thickening and small peri-device leaks versus concerning DRT and or large leaks, which may guide appropriate follow-up therapy and imaging uh, decision-making. So in summary, CT for left atrial appendage occlusion. CT can help select the ideal device, 
size, and type of device for success, and screen candidates suitable for left atrial appendage occlusion. CT provides a precise roadmap for implant planning that can improve procedural efficiency with the reduction in complications. And post-implant CT follow-up is a good alternative to TEE to assess procedural success and device-related complications. Thank you so much. We Thank can open so our questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Break. That was uh, that was amazing. And you have uh, such a great team, and and the the pictures were also beautiful. So uh, we can open for questions. Put your questions in the in the Q and A. And uh, Dr. Garcia, I think, has the, the first question. Rosha, that was a, a great uh, presentation um, and uh, quite impressive how, um, how well have you managed to, uh, to incorporate uh, CT for this application at uh, San Francisco. I wanted to ask you to that in that regard, what percentage of your uh, cases for um, T cardioversion and what percentage of your uh, watchman follow-ups do you do by TE versus CT, and um, have you have any issue with insurances uh, covering for the CT studies? So we have not had any issues for insurance coverage. Again, most of these patients are older with high comorbid conditions, so that has not been an issue. In terms of T cardio, uh, in terms of precardioversion, we're still doing most of them with TEE. We have started converting a little more to CT for patients who are difficult intubations, obese, other comorbid conditions. You know, COVID have active COVID, and one of the reasons may be our workflow because the cardioversions happen in our TE suite, irrespective. So some of that is just ease uh, and though I still think we can increase the number of patients coming through for CT precardioversion. In terms of pre post watchman assessment, uh, I was just talking to Leandro that over the past six months, we've seen a big increase in patients coming through our CT. Previously, uh, most of the patients were getting 45 day to two month uh, TEs. And now we're trying to do more of the two months to one year follow up with CT. So we've seen a big uptick in that in the past six months. Thank you very much. A lot of opportunities for, for many sites, I think, that uh, as compared to your site. And we, we're going to see a lot of increases. So Aldo has joined us as well. Hey, Arusha, I don't know if uh, you know, I'm having issues with my video. I don't know if you see me, but. I mean, it's uh, it's nice to kind of see you again, and uh, you know, see all the good stuff that uh, you know you and your team are doing, and and hopefully we can, you know, see uh, you know in the city. But um, I mean, this is uh, this was kind of an amazing talk. Uh, I'm a big proponent of the use of CT for for appendage uh, in general, um, especially uh, pre cardioversion and, and those people that can be kind of high risk of, we need some, um, you know, added information, for instance, like coronary assessment, at least on, in terms of blackboard. And so it can give you some, some additional set of information that could be additive and, and useful. And, and it's a very simple procedure. So the, the only question that I have for you is, 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 um, is actually on the, on the other side of the spectrum is in the post watchman. Okay. Um, you know, how do you, uh, report and how your team there in terms of EP uh, interpret uh, the, the parabola leaks, for instance. I mean, it, what I would do, I just check to see if there's harmful units, but if the units are high and, and there's like a percolation of the contrast, we need to decide if there's a parabola leak yes, or not, right? But if you identify it, what measurements you report? Because then you report like, usually they are oblong, right? So they're like a little a longer, uh, you know, and, and shorter against the wall. So do you report the both uh, diameters? Uh, you know, do you report the area? I mean, if, if you get, let's say, a shorter diameter, which is like two millimeters, but then the longer diameter along the rim is like five, then what the decision is there is, you know, should we, you know, which diameter we use? Should we continue anticoagulation? We should stop, we repeat until there's no leak at all? Or, or what's your, you know, what's your guys uh, are doing in that? 
So I think it depends on the case. Uh, if it's a very small leak, like something like this, a four millimeter, I, uh, or, you know, two to three, four millimeter, I just, we've been reporting them just in one dimension. If it's something bigger like this here at five millimeters, I'd want yeah. to report it in its area as well as, well as uh, multi more dimensions. Okay. So, so and then you are, as you see there before, you're measuring like what we will see actually in the T, which is, I mean, the shorter dimension between the struts and the wall of the appendage, as opposed to be the kind of kind of the quasi that's in conference, which is I, I think what that's what I you know we, I mean we tend to do too, but um you know, um you know um, I guess for the AP folks is that when you have one diameter is shorter, but the other one is bigger, it's like you know what do what to do, but I, I, you know I guess that you know we're doing similarly. Uh, and you know, so this is a good example, this case here. Uh, I don't know if you can, uh, you can see my screen. So here yeah. it looks like five millimeters, but when you take a look at this on axis view, you can see yeah. this whole area is uncovered. It's a crescentric area. Yeah. yeah. Which is why this, this device did not endothelialize because yeah. it, this is more than just a small leak. Yeah. Uh, at this point, in terms of interpretation that how you know our implanters are going to interpret that's where we have to work with them together to figure out you know this is not going to close even with time very good thank you very much we have also dr luigi di biase that thank you yeah uh, so, i think he has heard about the classification of the shape of the <laughs> since appendix. we have the, the the chicken wing uh master here uh or inventor uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, Rusha, have you seen any difference in, in the morphology of the appendage and the likelihood of uh, uh, poor apposition of the devices on the CT studies? So I, it, it comes back to how the device has been implanted. Of course, the are easier to implant and position well. And as a side, the chicken wing and all of them, depending on the depth, those become harder to implant or become malpositioned uh, something that we, an important concept is that at the beginning of this we were told that leaks before five millimeter could be ignored and there were no prothrombotic but the, the, the data uh, and the clinical experience has been different after and the evaluation of this leak is very very tricky uh, at times the 2d uh, te may not be enough and the 3DT can see better than the 2DT. We have example where there was no leak in 2D and, 3D and leak in 3D. So I think CT scan in this, uh, in this uh, you know, type of uh, uh, evaluation will do much better. The question I have for you is that, unfortunately, I believe CT scan is better than T for follow-up for even you know, patient satisfaction. The issue is that the NCDR mandate us to do uh, T at 45 days and within the year. How do you, you know, overrule that? So I was not aware of that. But that being said, there I've heard of many sites that have CT as standard of care as opposed to TEE. So that's something maybe I, we can reach out to those uh, uh, people and ask them. For us, we typically had been using TE as our standard of care 45 days, but we have seen an uptick in CT. So I don't know how to answer that question. And uh, the last one, um, we've been using also a lot of CT to guide the complicated case in case of leak. When there is a leak, what to do with the leak? And uh, uh, we have some experience uh, with uh, actually radiofrequency ablation trying to close the leak. Have you ever seen or uh, review any of these cases? So I heard about them. I haven't personally seen them being done yet at our site. But uh, I know for the smaller leaks, they definitely have been using radiofrequency ablation. For larger leaks, uh, plugs and occluder devices have been used. And that's where assessing the size and, you know, complete 3D assessment of the leak is important.
Yeah, that's actually for leaks. When you have a leak at the T and you plan doing something, you need to do a CT scan anyway because that's the best uh, the, the best tool we have to, to assess actually and to guide which type of closure you want to go for from the radio frequency to the endovascular coil to yeah. plugs. Thank you very much, Luigi, for, for the comment and, and Rusha for the answer as well. We have a question from uh, Safwan Gasanavi, one of our advanced imaging fellows. He says, fantastic talk. Thank you for sharing this lecture. Uh, he asks, have you seen some of the watchman devices sometimes that uh, they move a little bit more than normal? Or how do you describe that in, in your report, the movement of the device? So again, if it's if it's moving with the heart and the appendage, that's normal. If it has independent mobility, then we wouldn't call that a well-seated device. And we've seen them protruding outside of the appendage, kind of popping out. So that would be something you'd want to report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, doctors from uh, Andrew Kummerman, one of our EP doctors, have you noticed an increase in device-related thrombus on cardiac CT following the recent approval of that only treatment for patients post-Watchman? So we haven't seen our patients uh, transition to DAPT only, so I haven't seen that increase. Thank you. There's a comment from Apurva Patel. NCDR allows CTA at 45 days. TE is not compulsory. Okay, that's uh, that's good to know. Uh, I think uh, if places are doing it, there, there has to be a way of doing it like, like you were suggesting. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a, a question from uh, Annalisa Fields, one of our uh, imaging research fellows. She asked about uh, current data on, on left atrial appendage remodeling after the occluding device. Uh, is there any data there that you know? And uh, how we should how should we assess this after the, the implant? Is any uh, architect any changes on the structure of the appendage or on the left atrium? So when you talk about oversizing, one of the things we discussed when we do CT-based sizing, the patients typically euvolemic or normal at their normal volume. Uh, when you do TE-based sizing, you typically want to make sure the left atrial pressures are normal range or what you think is normal for the patient. So, so a lot of times if they're on the lower side, you kind of load them with volume before assessing. Uh, what you bring up is interesting in terms of LA left atrial appendage remodeling because a lot of things also depends on what was there, is there mitral regurgitation? Is the patient, does the patient have worsening of something else going on? Was the atrial fibrillation also simult simultaneously ablated, which could help in the remodeling if there's no longer atrial fibrillation? So I don't know of any uh, recent studies that have been published. Yeah, but but a very, very interesting point. I agree and, and interesting to look at. We have a question from Saurav uh, in Amulet. Is the flow around the rim normal? So a little bit of flow might be okay, but we just went over a case where, you know, if it's not flush with the wall of the left atrial appendage, that could cause a potential area for lack of endothelialization. So ideally you want them flush across the appendage wall. Thank you very much. Uh, quite, uh, Dr. Krumerman, one of our EP doctors, uh, go ahead. Uh, hi, great talk, and uh, thank you very much. My video, for some reason, is is wigging out on me. Um, so considering uh, radiation exposure, uh, and if you have to pick one or you think we can do both, would you choose a preoperative planning CT prior to a watchman device or, or an amulet device, or would you rather have a, a final postoperative uh, evaluation of your device when you could, you know, intermingle with, with uh, TEE in between these different uh, studies? If I could only choose one, then I do post. It, in terms of looking for complications or peri-device leak. But that being said, you know, we're talking about how cardiac CT is providing more accurate sizing information, which would help improve outcomes for post-device placement. So that is a hard one. 
Yeah, I, I, I struggle with this because if you imagine this person is going to have a pre-op, a post-op, there's going to be intraoperative radiation as well. Perhaps they've had another CAT scan uh, uh, to look for uh, coronary calcifications uh, for, for from a different cardiologist before they came to you. It At some point, I guess we need to be concerned about uh, the overall radiation. And I, I, I understand if you're 87 years old and you have a uh, an indication to be off of anticoagulants, but some of the patients that we're treating are in their 50s and 60s with AFib, and they have uh, uh, ble- you know GI bleeding, and they need to come off the AC. So that being said, the pre-scan can be a limited acquisition, so you don't need to do the full cardiac cycle. You don't; it can be dose modulated, so you can typically get away with just having a four to seven millisievert study which is not too high. Thank you. It's the post CT that you want a full cardiac cycle that's a higher in radiation dose. When you acquire these cases, do you ever acquire just the appendage or do you always acquire the full? I mean, you you probably have a a single bead CT acquisition, but do you you limit the radiation by by just limiting the the size? So we do limit the size. We want to make sure we capture the full left atrium and the appendage and uh, we don't uh, acquire the whole left ventricle always right yeah for delay we focus just on the left atrial appendage great that's very important to, to decrease the radiation we have an important question from rob Osfeld as well that i left for the end because it's a little bit different but it's very important there has been a push to comment on the presence of atherosclerosis on CT imaging done for reasons unrelated to atherosclerosis to help to optimize therapy. Uh, he says as a left ventral appendage CT imaging will be increasing in frequency. Is there, is there a push to routinely comment on the presence or lack of atherosclerosis in, in the coronary arteries in these studies? So we typically always comment on coronary artery calcification on all our studies. We typically uh, call it mild, moderate, severe calcification presence or absence of stents. And if needed, we can always go, if it's something that we can easily visualize, then we can give more specific comments. It's hard to always uh, describe stenosis since we haven't beta blocked or given sublingual nitro, but definitely I think for all patients getting a CT of the chest, it's important to give that additional information. Yeah, I, I agree, Rob. It's such a unique unique opportunity to find a subclinical atherosclerosis uh, that it should be reported. Do you do all these cases gated or do you ever do it non-gated? All of ours are gated. All gated, okay. All our cardiac studies are gated and we do them as a cardiology group. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. This was wonderful. I'm sure a lot of people will be, you know, looking at this lecture when they're trying to set up their their program uh, to use the CT for appendage. So this will help a lot of patients, I think. Thank you so much. Thanks, okay. Rusha. Nice to to hear uh, you. And I think Apurva is probably in the in the crowd. So hi to you both. Nice to to hear hear you guys. Bye bye. Bye.